Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Naomi, Taylor, Ted, Allison, and Christopher. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. And because you're supporters in the month of February, you and everyone else who supports us via Patreon or buymeacoffee.com will be entered in a raffle at the end of the month, the prize for which is a personal episode of Boring Books for Bedtime, made just for you. And because it's just for you, copyright restrictions do not apply. So if you've ever wanted to fall asleep to Stephen Hawking or 101 uses for a spork, this is your chance. So, if you're interested in being entered into this raffle and supporting us either by becoming a subscriber on Patreon or dropping a one-time tip, no subscription required, via buymeacoffee.com, you'll find links to both of those in the show description. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight we're returning to one of the foundational classics of modern science. On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life by Charles Darwin, M.A., fellow of the Royal Geological Linnaean Etc. Societies, author of Journal of Researches during H.M.S. Beagle's Voyage Round the World, from the first edition, published by John Murray, Abermarl Street, London, in 1859. Let's pick up right where we left off in Chapter 1, Variation Under Domestication. On the view here given of the all-important part which selection by man has played, it becomes at once obvious how it is that our domestic races show adaptation in their structure or in their habits to man's wants or fancies. We can, I think, further understand the frequently abnormal character of our domestic races, and likewise their differences, being so great in external characters and relatively so slight in internal parts or organs. Man can hardly select, or only with much difficulty, any deviation of structure excepting such as is externally visible, and indeed he rarely cares for what is internal. He can never act by selection, excepting on variations which are first given to him in some slight degree by nature. No man would ever try to make a fantail till he saw a pigeon with a tail developed in some slight degree in an unusual manner, or a pouter till he saw a pigeon with a crop of somewhat unusual size, and the more abnormal or unusual any character was when it first appeared, the more likely it would be to catch his attention. But to use such an expression as trying to make a fantail is, I have no doubt, in most cases, utterly incorrect. The man who first selected a pigeon with a slightly larger tail never dreamed what the descendants of that pigeon would become 
through long-continued, partly unconscious and partly methodical selection. Perhaps the parent bird of all fantails had only 14 tail feathers somewhat expanded, like the present Java fantail, or like individuals of other and distinct breeds, in which as many as 17 tail feathers have been counted. Perhaps the first pouter pigeon did not inflate its crop much more than the turbot now does the upper part of its esophagus, a habit which is disregarded by all fanciers, as it is not one of the points of the breed. Nor let it be thought that some great deviation of structure would be necessary to catch the fancier's eye. He perceives extremely small differences, and it is in human nature to value any novelty, however slight, in one's own possession. Nor must the value which would formerly be set on any slight differences in the individuals of the same species be judged of by the value which would now be set on them, after several breeds have once fairly been established. Many slight differences might, and indeed do now, arise amongst pigeons, which are rejected as faults or deviations from the standard of perfection of each breed. The common goose has not given rise to any marked varieties. Hence the Toulouse and the common breed, which differ only in color, that most fleeting of characters, have lately been exhibited as distinct at our poultry shows. I think these views further explain what has sometimes been noticed, namely that we know nothing about the origin or history of any of our domestic breeds. But in fact, a breed, like a dialect of a language, can hardly be said to have had a definite origin. A man preserves and breeds from an individual with some slight deviation of structure or takes more care than usual in matching his best animals and thus improves them, and the improved individuals slowly spread in the immediate neighborhood. But as yet, they will hardly have a distinct name, and from being only slightly valued, their history will be disregarded. When further improved by the same slow and gradual process, they will spread more widely, and will get recognized as something distinct and valuable, and will then probably first receive a provincial name. In semi-civilized countries with little free communication, the spreading and knowledge of any new subbreed will be a slow process. As soon as the points of value of the new subbreed are once fully acknowledged, the principle, as I have called it, of unconscious selection will always tend, perhaps more at one period than at another, as the breed rises or falls in fashion, perhaps more in one district than in another, according to the state of civilization of the inhabitants, slowly to add to the characteristic features of the breed, whatever they may be but the chance will be infinitely small of any record having been preserved of such slow, varying, and insensible changes. I must now say a few words on the circumstances, favorable or the reverse, to man's power of selection. A high degree of variability is obviously favorable, as freely giving the materials for selection to work on. Not that mere individual differences are not amply sufficient, with extreme care, to allow of the accumulation of a large amount of modification in almost any desired direction. But as variations manifestly useful or pleasing to man appear only occasionally, the chance of their appearance will be much increased 
by a large number of individuals being kept. And hence this comes to be of the highest importance to success. On this principle, Marshall has remarked, with respect to the sheep of parts of Yorkshire, that, as they generally belong to poor people and are mostly in small lots, they never can be improved. On the other hand, nurserymen, from raising large stocks of the same plants, are generally far more successful than amateurs in getting new and valuable varieties. The keeping of a large number of individuals of a species in any country requires that the species should be placed under favorable conditions of life so as to breed freely in that country. When the individuals of any species are scanty, all the individuals, whatever their quality may be, will generally be allowed to breed, and this will effectually prevent selection. But probably the most important point of all is that the animal or plant should be so highly useful to man or so much valued by him that the closest attention should be paid to even the slightest deviation in the qualities or structure of each individual. Unless such attention be paid, nothing can be affected. I have seen it gravely remarked that it was most fortunate that the strawberry began to vary just when gardeners began to attend closely to this plant. No doubt the strawberry had always varied since it was cultivated, but the slight varieties had been neglected. As soon, however, as gardeners picked out individual plants with slightly larger, earlier, or better fruit and raised seedlings from them, and again picked out the best seedlings and bred from them, then there appeared aided by some crossing with distinct species, those many admirable varieties of the strawberry which have been raised during the last thirty or forty years. In the case of animals with separate sexes, facility in preventing crosses is an important element of success in the formation of new races, at least in a country which is already stocked with other races. In this respect, enclosure of the land plays a part. Wandering inhabitants of open plains rarely possess more than one breed of the same species. Pigeons can be mated for life, and this is a great convenience to the fancier. For thus many races may be kept true, though mingled in the same aviary and this circumstance must have largely favored the improvement and formation of new breeds. Pigeons, I may add, can be propagated in great numbers and at a very quick rate, and inferior birds may be freely rejected, as when killed they serve for food. On the other hand, cats, from their nocturnal rambling habits, cannot be matched and although so much valued by women and children, we hardly ever see a distinct breed kept up. Such breeds as we do sometimes see are almost always imported from some other country, often from islands. Although I do not doubt that some domestic animals vary less than others, yet the rarity or absence of distinct breeds of the cat the donkey, peacock, goose, etc., may be attributed in main part to selection not having been brought into play. In cats, from the difficulty in pairing them. In donkeys, from only a few being kept by poor people and little attention paid to their breeding. In peacocks, from not being very easily reared and a large stock not kept. In geese, from being valuable only for two purposes, 
food, and feathers, and more especially from no pleasure having been felt in the display of distinct breeds. To sum up on the origin of our domestic races of animals and plants, I believe that the conditions of life from their action on the reproductive system are so far of the highest importance as causing variability. I do not believe that variability is an inherent and necessary contingency under all circumstances with all organic beings, as some authors have thought. The effects of variability are modified by various degrees of inheritance and of reversion. Variability is governed by many unknown laws, more especially by that of correlation of growth. Something may be attributed to the direct action of the conditions of life. Something must be attributed to use and disuse. The final result is thus rendered infinitely complex. In some cases, I do not doubt that the intercrossing of species aboriginally distinct has played an important part in the origin of our domestic productions. When in any country several domestic breeds have once been established, their occasional intercrossing with the aid of selection has, no doubt, largely aided in the formation of new subbreeds. But the importance of the crossing of varieties has, I believe, been greatly exaggerated, both in regard to animals and to those plants which are propagated by seed. In plants which are temporarily propagated by cuttings, buds, etc., the importance of the crossing both of distinct species and of varieties is immense. For the cultivator here quite disregards the extreme variability both of hybrids and mongrels and the frequent sterility of hybrids. But the cases of plants not propagated by seed are of little importance to us, for their endurance is only temporary. Over all these causes of change, I am convinced that the accumulative action of selection, whether applied methodically and more quickly, or unconsciously and more slowly, but more efficiently, is by far the predominant power. Chapter 2 Variation Under Nature Variability Individual Differences, Doubtful Species Wide-ranging, much diffused and common species vary most. Species of the larger genera in any country vary more than the species of the smaller genera. Many of the species of the larger genera resemble varieties in being very closely but unequally related to each other, and in having restricted ranges. Before applying the principles arrived at in the last chapter to organic beings in a state of nature, we must briefly discuss whether these latter are subject to any variation. To treat this subject at all properly, a long catalogue of dry facts should be given, but these I shall reserve for my future work. Nor shall I here discuss the various definitions which have been given of the term species. No one definition has as yet satisfied all naturalists, yet every naturalist knows vaguely what he means when he speaks of a species. Generally, the term includes the unknown element of a distinct act of creation. The term variety is almost equally difficult to define, but here community of descent is almost universally implied, though it can rarely be proved. 
we have also what are called monstrosities, but they graduate into varieties. By monstrosity, I presume is meant some considerable deviation of structure in one part, either injurious to or not useful to the species, and not generally propagated. Some authors use the term variation in a technical sense, as implying a modification directly due to the physical conditions of life, and variations in this sense are supposed not to be inherited. But who can say that the dwarfed condition of shells in the brackish waters of the Baltic, or dwarfed plants on alpine summits, or the thicker fur of an animal from far northwards, would not in some cases be inherited for at least some few generations. And in this case, I presume that the form would be called a variety. Again, we have many slight differences which may be called individual differences, such as are known frequently to appear in the offspring from the same parents, or which may be presumed to have thus arisen from being frequently observed in the individuals of the same species inhabiting the same confined locality. No one supposes that all the individuals of the same species are cast in the very same mold. These individual differences are highly important for us, as they afford materials for natural selection to accumulate in the same manner as man can accumulate in any given direction individual differences in his domesticated productions. These individual differences generally affect what naturalists consider unimportant parts, but I could show by a long catalogue of facts that parts which must be called important whether viewed under a physiological or classificatory point of view, sometimes vary in the individuals of the same species. I am convinced that the most experienced naturalist would be surprised at the number of the cases of variability, even in important parts of structure, which he could collect on good authority, as I have collected, during a course of years. It should be remembered that systematists are far from pleased at finding variability in important characters, and that there are not many men who will laboriously examine internal and important organs and compare them in many specimens of the same species. I should never have expected that the branching of the main nerves close to the great central ganglion of an insect, would have been variable in the same species. I should have expected that changes of this nature could have been affected only by slow degrees. Yet quite recently, Mr. Lubbock has shown a degree of variability in these main nerves in coccus, which may almost be compared to the irregular branching of the stem of a tree. This philosophical naturalist, I may add, has also quite recently shown that the muscles in the larvae of certain insects are very far from uniform. Authors sometimes argue in a circle when they state that important organs never vary, for these same authors practically rank that character as important, as some few naturalists have honestly confessed which does not vary. And under this point of view, no instance of an important part varying will ever be found. But under any other point of view, many instances assuredly can be given. There is one point connected with individual differences, which seems to me extremely perplexing. I refer to those genera which have sometimes been called protean or polymorphic, in which the species present an inordinate amount of variation. 
and hardly two naturalists can agree which forms to rank as species and which as varieties. We may instance Rubus, Rosa, and Harassium amongst plants, several genera of insects, and several genera of brachiopod shells. In most polymorphic genera, some of the species have fixed and definite characters. Genera which are polymorphic in one country seem to be, with some few exceptions, polymorphic in other countries. And likewise, judging from brachiopod shells at former periods of time. These facts seem to be very perplexing, for they seem to show that this kind of variability is independent of the conditions of life. I am inclined to suspect that we see in these polymorphic genera variations in points of structure which are of no service or disservice to the species, and which, consequently, have not been seized on and rendered definite by natural selection, as hereafter will be explained. Those forms which possess in some considerable degree the character of species, but which are so closely similar to some other forms, or are so closely linked to them by intermediate gradations that naturalists do not like to rank them as distinct species, are in several respects the most important for us. We have every reason to believe that many of these doubtful and closely allied forms have permanently retained their characters in their own country for a long time, for as long, as far as we know, as have good and true species. Practically, when a naturalist can unite two forms together by others having intermediate characters, he treats the one as a variety of the other, ranking the most common, but sometimes the one first described as the species and the other as the variety. But cases of great difficulty, which I will not here enumerate, sometimes occur in deciding whether or not to rank one form as a variety of another, even when they are closely connected by intermediate links. Nor will the commonly assumed hybrid nature of the intermediate links always remove the difficulty. In very many cases, however, one form is ranked as a variety of another. Not because the intermediate links have actually been found, but because analogy leads the observer to suppose that they either do now somewhere exist, or may formerly have existed, and here a wide door for the entry of doubt and conjecture is opened. Hence, in determining whether a form should be ranked as a species or a variety, the opinion of naturalists having sound judgment and wide experience seems the only guide to follow. We must, however, in many cases, decide by a majority of naturalists, for few well-marked and well-known varieties can be named, which have not been ranked as species by at least some competent judges. That varieties of this doubtful nature are far from uncommon cannot be disputed. Compare the several floras of Great Britain, of France, or of the United States, drawn up by different botanists, and see what a surprising number of forms have been ranked by one botanist as good species, and by another as mere varieties. Mr. H. C. Watson, to whom I lie under deep obligation for assistance of all kinds, has marked for me 182 British plants, which are generally considered as varieties, but which have all been ranked by botanists as species, and in making this list he has omitted many trifling varieties but which, nevertheless, 
have been ranked by some botanists as species, and he has entirely omitted several highly polymorphic genera. Under genera, including the most polymorphic forms, Mr. Babington gives 251 species, whereas Mr. Bentham gives only 112, a difference of 139 doubtful forms. Amongst animals which unite for each birth and which are highly locomotive, doubtful forms, ranked by one zoologist as a species and by another as a variety, can rarely be found within the same country, but are common in separated areas. How many of those birds and insects in North America and Europe, which differ very slightly from each other, have been ranked by one eminent naturalist as undoubted species, and by another as varieties, or, as they are so often called, as geographical races. Many years ago, when comparing and seeing others compare the birds from the separate islands of the Galapagos archipelago, both one with another and with those from the American mainland, I was much struck how entirely vague and arbitrary is the distinction between species and varieties. On the islets of the little Madeira group, there are many insects which are characterized as varieties in Mr. Wollaston's admirable work, but which it cannot be doubted would be ranked as distinct species by many entomologists. Even Ireland has a few animals, now generally regarded as varieties, but which have been ranked as species by some zoologists. Several most experienced ornithologists consider our British red grouse as only a strongly marked race of a Norwegian species, whereas the greater number rank it as an undoubted species peculiar to Great Britain. A wide distance between the homes of two doubtful forms leads many naturalists to rank both as distinct species. But what distance, it has been well asked, will suffice? If that between America and Europe is ample, will that between the continent and the Azores, or Madeira, or the Canaries, or Ireland, be sufficient? It must be admitted that many forms, considered by highly competent judges as varieties, have so perfectly the character of species that they are ranked by other highly competent judges as good and true species. But to discuss whether they are rightly called species or varieties, before any definition of these terms has been generally accepted, is vainly to beat the air. Many of the cases of strongly marked varieties or doubtful species well deserve consideration. For several interesting lines of argument, from geographical distribution, analogical variation, hybridism, etc., have been brought to bear on the attempt to determine their rank. I will here give only a single instance, the well-known one of the primrose and cowslip, or primula veris and alatior. These plants differ considerably in appearance. They have a different flavor and emit a different odor. They flower at slightly different periods. They grow in somewhat different stations. They ascend mountains to different heights. They have different geographical ranges. And lastly, according to very numerous experiments made during several years, by that most careful observer, Gartner, they can be crossed only with much difficulty. We could hardly wish for better evidence of the two forms being specifically distinct. On the other hand, they are united by many intermediate links, and it is very doubtful whether these links are hybrids. And there is, as it seems to me, 
an overwhelming amount of experimental evidence showing that they descend from common parents and consequently must be ranked as varieties. Close investigation in most cases will bring naturalists to an agreement how to rank doubtful forms. Yet it must be confessed that it is in the best known countries that we find the greatest number of forms of doubtful value. I have been struck with the fact that if any animal or plant in a state of nature be highly useful to man or from any cause closely attract his attention, varieties of it will almost universally be found recorded. These varieties, moreover, will be often ranked by some authors as species. Look at the common oak, how closely it has been studied. Yet a German author makes more than a dozen species out of forms, which are very generally considered as varieties. And in this country, the highest botanical authorities and practical men can be quoted to show that the sessile and pedunculated oaks are either good and distinct species or mere varieties. When a young naturalist commences the study of a group of organisms quite unknown to him, he is at first much perplexed to determine what differences to consider as specific and what as varieties, for he knows nothing of the amount and kind of variation to which the group is subject. And this shows at least how, very generally, there is some variation. But if he confine his attention to one class within one country, he will soon make up his mind how to rank most of the doubtful forms. His general tendency will be to make many species, for he will become impressed, just like the pigeon or poultry fancier before alluded to, with the amount of difference in the forms which he is continually studying and he has little general knowledge of analogical variation in other groups and in other countries by which to correct his first impressions. As he extends the range of his observations, he will meet more cases of difficulty, for he will encounter a greater number of closely allied forms. But if his observations be widely extended, he will, in the end, generally be enabled to make up his own mind which to call varieties and which species, but he will succeed in this at the expense of admitting much variation, and the truth of this admission will often be disputed by other naturalists. When, moreover, he comes to study allied forms brought from countries not now continuous, in which case he can hardly hope to find the intermediate links between his doubtful forms. He will have to trust almost entirely to analogy, and his difficulties will rise to a climax. Certainly, no clear line of demarcation has as yet been drawn between species and subspecies. That is, the forms which in the opinion of some naturalists come very near to but do not quite arrive at the rank of species. Or again, between subspecies and well-marked varieties, or between lesser varieties and individual differences. These differences blend into each other in an insensible series, and a series impresses the mind with the idea of an actual passage. Hence, I look at individual differences, though of small interest to the systematist, as of high importance for us, as being the first step towards such slight varieties as are barely thought worth recording in works on natural history. And I look at varieties which are in any degree more distinct and permanent, as steps leading to more strongly marked and more permanent varieties and at these latter as leading to subspecies and to species. The passage from one stage of difference to another and higher stage may be, in some cases, 
due merely to the long-continued action of different physical conditions in two different regions. But I have not much faith in this view, and I attribute the passage of a variety from a state in which it differs very slightly from its parent to one in which it differs more to the action of natural selection in accumulating, as will hereafter be more fully explained, differences of structure in certain definite directions. Hence, I believe, a well-marked variety may be justly called an incipient species. But whether this belief be justifiable must be judged of by the general weight of the several facts and views given throughout this work. It need not be supposed that all varieties or incipient species necessarily attain the rank of species. They may, whilst in this incipient state, become extinct, or they may endure as varieties for very long periods, as has been shown to be the case by Mr. Wollaston with the varieties of certain fossil land shells in Madeira. If a variety were to flourish so as to exceed in numbers the parent species, it would then rank as the species and the species as the variety, or it might come to supplant and exterminate the parent species, or both might coexist and both rank as independent species. But we shall hereafter have to return to this subject. From these remarks it will be seen that I look at the term species as one arbitrarily given for the sake of convenience to a set of individuals closely resembling each other, and that it does not essentially differ from the term variety, which is given to less distinct and more fluctuating forms. The term variety, again, in comparison with mere individual differences, is also applied arbitrarily and for mere convenience sake. Guided by theoretical considerations, I thought that some interesting results might be obtained in regard to the nature and relations of the species which vary most by tabulating all the varieties in several well-worked floras. At first this seemed a simple task, but Mr. H. C. Watson to whom I am much indebted for valuable advice and assistance on this subject, soon convinced me that there were very many difficulties, as did subsequently Dr. Hooker, even in stronger terms. I shall reserve for my future work the discussion of these difficulties and the tables themselves of the proportional numbers of the varying species. Dr. Hooker permits me to add that after having carefully read my manuscript and examined the tables, he thinks that the following statements are fairly well established. The whole subject, however, treated as it necessarily here is with much brevity, is rather perplexing, and allusions cannot be avoided to the struggle for existence, divergence of character, and other questions hereafter to be discussed. Alphonse de Candolle and others have shown that plants which have very wide ranges generally present varieties, and this might have been expected as they become exposed to diverse physical conditions and as they come into competition, which, as we shall hereafter see, is a far more important circumstance with different sets of organic beings. But my tables further show that in any limited country, the species which are most common, that is, abound most in individuals, and the species which are most widely diffused within their own country, and this is a different consideration from wide range, and to a certain extent from commonness, often give rise to varieties sufficiently well marked to have been recorded in botanical works. Hence it is the most flourishing, or as they may be called, the dominant species, those which range widely over the world, are the most diffused in their own country, 
and are the most numerous in individuals, which oftenest produce well-marked varieties, or, as I consider them, incipient species. And this perhaps might have been anticipated, for as varieties, in order to become in any degree permanent, necessarily have to struggle with the other inhabitants of the country, the species which are already dominant will be the most likely to yield offspring which, though in some slight degree modified, will still inherit those advantages that enabled their parents to become dominant over their compatriots. If the plants inhabiting a country and described in any flora be divided into two equal masses, all those in the larger genera being placed on one side and all those in the smaller on the other side, a somewhat larger number of the very common and much diffused or dominant species will be found on the side of the larger genera. This again might have been anticipated, for the mere fact of many species of the same genus inhabiting any country shows that there is something in the organic or inorganic conditions of that country favorable to the genus, and consequently we might have expected to have found in the larger genera, or those including many species, a large proportional number of dominant species. But so many causes tend to obscure this result, that I am surprised that my tables show even a small majority on the side of the larger genera. I will here allude to only two causes of obscurity. Fresh water and salt-loving plants have generally very wide ranges and are much diffused, but this seems to be connected with the nature of the stations inhabited by them, and has little or no relation to the size of the genera to which the species belong. Again, plants low in the scale of organization are generally much more widely diffused than plants higher in the scale. And here again, there is no close relation to the size of the genera. The cause of lowly organized plants ranging widely will be discussed in our chapter on geographical distribution. And with that, I think we'll end this evening's reading from On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin. I'm almost sad to end there because I think we're just about to get to the good stuff, but we'll leave that for another time. If you just can't wait and would like to read this classic science text for yourself, as always, I'll leave a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from a work we've already started, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email via our website, www.BoringBooksPod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>